Så välkomna den här eftermiddag till Utrikespolitiska institutet och en diskussion kring ett land och en konflikt och en process som många av er har följt över åren där hoppen har varit få sen kommit och nu har vi en chans att få reda på hur det står till i verkligheten. Vår Joakim Kreutz är Burma-expert, forskare här på UI och jag är väldigt tacksam till honom för det förberedelsearbete som vi haft till denna eftermiddag. Men jag vill naturligtvis särskilt eh, välkomna våra två gäster and from this point on I'm shifting to English even though uh, Marte you very well know Swedish <laughs> uh, being Norwegian and a historian at Prio the Peace Research Institute in Oslo um, a long-standing uh, watcher of Burma and with us today to speak to the uh, political process inside Burma, the uh, democratization, the challenges, the political process, if we can bring it there. Obviously our specific guest from Burma itself is uh, uh, Maung Zarni. You are described as a dissident in exile. And I'm sure you will give our audience, many of them I'm sure are already knowledgeable, but a description of what you have sought to do and what you bring here. You have a, a special background in that you are yourself not only a dissident but a researcher and uh, you have spent time at Harvard uh, Medical School with the Harvard Global Equality Initiative you've been a visiting fellow with the Civil Society and Human Security Research Unit at the LSE, the London School of Economics and you are a founder of the Free Burma Coalition so we have quite a panel here uh, who will speak to our issues and the way we have decided to proceed is to ask you, Marte, to give a little bit of a overall political background on where we stand. Over to you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I'll see how to organize myself here. If you like to speak from the podium, you can do. If you are comfortable there, you can... I'll do that. Yeah. So, we have said about 15... 15-20 minutes each and then Joachim will come back with challenges and then we will turn to the audience. Cool. Marte. Thank you. These days there's always so much gadgets on the podium but I'll make my room. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to Utrikspolitiska Institutet. Uh, my name is Marte Nilsson and I as was announced I work for since 2012 I've been working on uh, projects on Myanmar reforms and its impact on ethnic conflicts at Peace Research Institute in Oslo. And um, we've been asked to answer the question about what happened to the peace and democratization process in Burma. And uh, as we talked before co coming in here, so we're pre pretty much well, we will have three quite different answers to what's happening at the moment. And nobody really knows either. So it's all sort of assessments of, of where you stand. But I'll try to give. Uh, an answer from, from what the research I've done in, in, in uh, Burma, Myanmar since 2012. And I think the short answer to what's going on with the peace process and the democratization is that it's still going on. But the problem maybe is that there has been too high expectations of how rosy these transitions would be. Not least because there was a, um, the changes that took place in 2011 with, uh, with President Thein Sein's uh, government 
took the at least the international and also the local community by surprise. There were some um, promising initiatives by the government, but all along, for anyone who knows Myanmar, it's uh, been clear all along that both tasks will be immensely difficult, and this is what we see now as well. But I will say that democratization, it is happening. I think, uh, there w I think there will be an election in October and November. I maybe also relatively free and fair, uh, at least on election day. But there will be an extremely unleveled playing field and the United, uh, the Union Election Commission uh, will do its best, I think, to affect the results somehow. There is the constitution that is uh, unfair by international standards. There's also uh, regula regulations about who is able to vote, who, is, who will be able to run for, uh, for parties, what parties will be allowed. All these things, in addition to voting lists and how the constituencies will be put together, uh, is quite uncertain at the moment. We don't really know how it's going to be. So yes, um, 2015, I think it will be a litmus test for the democrati democratization um, of, of Myanmar, but it will also, also be the first step. It's not sort of like, okay, we've had election, now we've reached democracy. It's just going to be the first step. Um, and the negotiations and the bargaining after the election, I think, will be key for how... Uh, the next elections and the next elections then will be. Uh, I also would say that there is a peace process. There is a mutual understanding that there is a need for political process uh, and that that will involve power sharing, uh, ethnic rights, but there is no s national ceasefire accord still. Uh, and every time I meet anyone involved in the national ceasefire, especially from the government side, uh, it's, uh, well, give us two months, give us three months. It's just around the corner. We're like, we are so close now. And I think I met Ula Ul Shui at the Myanmar Peace, he's one of the key negotiators at the Myanmar Peace Center in March. Uh, 2012, and at that point he said, well, give me two months, Marta, and then we'll have uh, the KIA, the, the Kachin Independence Army, on board. Uh, and every time I meet them, there's immense optimism, but the details and the nitty-gritty of just getting a ceasefire, which also will just be the first step, is very, very difficult. So... Uh, and one of, the, one of the reasons, of course, it's difficult is because there's still fighting going on. Uh, especially in Kachin state. Uh, and there is a lot, well, there's fundamental lack of trust between all parts. And there's an understandable disagreement among ethnic uh, minorities, maybe most of all between the Kachin and the Karen, but also within the Karen National Union. So the, there are some quite different interests also on the, on the ethnic minority side. So there's 60 years of continuous civil war. And this is going to take a very long time. Even if there is a ceasefire, then that's just the start of a political process that needs to happen. If there is no political process, then the ceasefire will be annulled as well. So this is going to take many years. And it's, perhaps it's unrealistic that there will be peace in all areas at the same time. Shifting conflict zones, we've seen that all along, that could continue and uh, might even be in the interest of the Myanmar army or the Damador. And I'll come back to that as well. The main reason for the stagnation in the peace process at this point, I think, is the elections in 2012. No, 2015, sorry. Um, there's, it's unlikely that will be a signing on Union Day. There's been a lot of talk about sign, signing a national peace accord uh, or a ceasefire accord uh, on Union Day. That would be symbolic. It would, President U Thein Sein would love it and his minister U Omin would love it, for sure. That would give them a, a very important legacy for that government that is um, going to leave office in 2015, after the 2015 elections. I think it's very unlikely that there will be 
uh, this uh, ceasefire. There might be a signing of some sort, but it's not going to be a ceasefire. Because the question, the big question that um, ethnic armed groups have to ask themselves is, will ethnic armed groups gain or lose from a pre-election deal? And settling something before a new government would be something that many of the ethnic uh, armed groups have thought be, would be in their interest. Um, perhaps the Tatmadaw would be committed but there, because we know there is at least some connection with the government, with the with the president and the, the chief, um, with, the, with the head of the army. But then others might view it as better to wait to strike a deal to the people who will actually be in position to do the further negotiations, which will be the people who win the election. But if this, that is the NLD, it's a bit of ris risky business because they they have no po power over the Tatmadaw. Uh, and also the NLD surely will have their own uh, problems after the election trying to to govern uh, with with um, with the with the Tatmadaw with this in its uh, position in Parliament, and there are maybe more realistic that there will be other power constellations, not just a NLD government, but maybe some sort of coalition between the NLD, but the USDP. Nobody really knows, and it's really hard to know who the negotiator will be. So this is also the big dilemma for ethnic armed groups about whether to strike a deal or not, and there's the, the various groups view their chances differently as well. Also, I think we have to recognize that the stagnation could come from factions within the old elite who do not want to see Uthain Sein or Uang Min succeed in their negotiation. Maybe they want that victory for their own. So some sort of splits within the old regime is also something we have to keep in mind. But I think overall the elections, they are important and everyone is sort of pending right now. So nothing is really happening with the reforms and, and with the peace process because nobody really knows what happened with the elections. And some people also try to somehow affect the outcome and try to affect the outcome. And this is why at PRIA we have seen at the risk, we've look, tried to look at the risk of electoral violence prior to and also after the elections. We know the academic literature clearly states that democratization in ethnically divided states are rarely peaceful, contrary to popular belief, perhaps. Uh, underlying distrust between ethnic and religious groups are exploited and they, in, in a way to try and uh, attract swing votes. And since the 2012 increase, there's been increase in religious and ethnic violence in Myanmar, particularly in Rakhine State, which I'm sure Zani will talk more about, uh, with the attacks on the Rohingya population. But I th also think we have to view this in connection with a more general Buddhist nationalist movement that is also attacking um, Muslim communities across Myanmar and, and particularly in, in the central parts of Myanmar. And, and May, July in 2013 was also one of the more grim examples of that. This also must be viewed as part of the competition for political power. Some people are quick to state that the Tatmadaw instigates violence to stage a coup, to make a, a sort of a, an excuse to stage a coup. I think that's unlikely because this is the reforms are the junta, the former regime's roadmap to discipline flourishing democracies. This is something, something they have been working for for a long time. They put a lot of prestige in it. They want to see the transition succeed, but they don't want it to succeed too much, not at any cost. So they also want to prevent the NLD to take all the seats in the Bemar constituencies and leave the Tatmadaw to sort of secure and safeguard the constitution with their 25% appointed MPs. For the old regime to keep a certain legitimacy, they need the USDP to win some seats as well. And the Buddhist nationalist movements, the 969 movements and the Mabatha and the Mabatha bills, the, 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 the bills to safeguard race and religion or nationality and religion, are means that can be exploited. Um.
to exploit anti-Muslim and anti-Rohingya sentiments, to take focus away from political issues, be they constitutional amendments, uh, human rights, land rights, etc., and concentrate on the perceived Muslim threats in Myanmar. So it's a way to sort of shift focus from actual political issues over to uh, some sort of nationality uh, issue or, or a, a, a nationalism or Buddhist nationalism. However, I think it's important not to view 969 movements or Mabatha as only political tools. I mean, there are, there is a problem in in Myanmar with Buddhist nationalism that is a problem in itself and it has to do with a lack of an inclusive national identity in the country. But it, they certainly are also are used as a political tool and, and we have to be able to uh, disclose that as well. Studies from other countries show that if the people in control of security forces send clear signals that they will not tolerate ethnic and religious violence, they are able to stop the violence from escalating. And in cases where violence is allowed to escalate, the people in power are likely to benefit from the violence. So this is a lesson we also need to, to keep in mind when we try to analyze what's going on in Myanmar. And about the peace process, I think it's unlikely that the elections will have a very large effect on the level of violence in ethnic areas. But post-election situation may be very dangerous. If we see that NLD takes what will be perceived as from ethnic minority side to take ethnic seats from their areas, they will, there will be a lot of disgruntlements among ethnic minorities. And also if NLD and USDP power struggle gets to dominate the whole political scene, which is also quite likely, uh, we will see marginalized ethnic MPs and perhaps also ethnic armed groups that lose faith in democracy. Democracy didn't really work for us. And we can then see uh, that we might, that might lead to a renewed violence and collapse or, or partly collapse of the peace process. And the Tamado on its side would want the peace process to continue, at least that's my belief. But it's not vital that the, all areas are involved. And I think Kachin State is, is probably one of the areas where it's more or less convenient to have a certain conflict level because there's a lot of um, nat natural resources there. Um, and it was also suit the army if the political dialogue proved a little bit tedious. So they, they can say, okay, well, it's still going on. We're still online here, but, uh, but the solution about getting a federal state, it's not very appealing for the army. So they will not be in a big rush to, to get a solution either. So uh, to, to, run, uh, to end up here, it's, my assessment is that I think that Tatmada wants to see somewhat democratic transition and a, some kind of su successful peace process, but I think it has clear interest in maintaining a certain level of conflict which can legitima legitimize its constitutional prerog prerogatives, which is of course 25% uh, representation in all parliaments. Um, it, it's the um, control or full control over border areas, the right to seize power if national security is perceived as threatened. And the bottom line in Myanmar is that the Myanmar model is a top-down process. The Tatmado want to keep a certain level of control. So, as in all other countries, it's the struggle of the people that eventually will determine the success of the reforms and the peace process. It's not just the bottom-up process, but it's also how um, this process is received on the ground and how people are able to use that momentum to mobilize for a fair society. So I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks. Thank you very much. Dear Marte, thanks very much for uh, such a vivid uh, description holding up the possible um, all through. And now we turn to, uh, to uh, Dr. Zarni Maung. Uh, you are with us to uh, speak uh, from your country and at uh, greater depth to what is at stake. Very much welcome.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the the large number of people in attendance. It um, is very encouraging to see uh, the uh, interest level among the Swedish uh, people here, because you know um, I don't know how many people have been to Burma or in the neighborhood, but this is not the uh, you know most um, pressing or first priority issue for many countries, not like Palestine or you know um, ISIS. So I'm thankful that. You're investing um, a few hours of your time in the afternoon. Um, before I say anything about, you know, three things that I talk about, the three things I will talk about, um, the reform process, broadly speaking, the the context in which reforms were launched, the the nature of the reforms, the individuals and institutions involved, and the second point I talk about is the uh, uh, the ceasefire processes. Uh, you know, the, uh, and then the last point, I would take up the issue of um, Rohingya persecution by the state over the past 37 years and touch on the anti-Muslim, uh, Burmese, in quotes, uh, Buddhist racism. Um, firstly, I need to mention my background um, a bit in a bit more details because uh, yeah. um, I don't usually put that in any like bio because uh, it would be inappropriate. Um, but put in a nutshell, I've been in different camps and I also came, the camps meaning um, I came from a, a large extended military family uh, whose members include, um, you know, say VIP pilot to Ne Win. Uh, Than Chui is the commanding officer. Than Chui is the uh, you know aging despot in Burma, uh, who married Than Chui when he was a young captain and his wife. And I myself was a military aspirant. I was actually admit myself at the age of 16 to officers' training school. I would be an officer and doing all kinds of dodgy things if it weren't for my father, who said. If you join the army, you, you no longer have a parent or home. And so he stopped me right there. So um, my uncles were in the army. So when they are back from their, um, you know, uh, border patrols or operations, they brought back their, you know, um, machine guns, pistol. They taught me how to disassemble, you know, uh, uh, theories. And then actually the, the ones who allow me to fire weapons to actually um, home my... Um, firing skills is the Quran in the Quran National Liberation Army, you know, all kinds of weapons. And so, um, so my advantage as a, um, not simply as the Burmese, but as an analyst is, I have been able to see the Burmese realities through different lenses. I mean, like you know, the the beauty of a human world is that we can look at the same reality, the same set of like uh, factors, come up with radically different interpretations. Yeah, and so there will be a lot of things I say that will contradict what Marty's um, have uh, mentioned. And there's uh, no ill will here with colleagues. <laughs> so, um, firstly, reform process. If you recall, the um, back in 2007, there was uh, something called the uh, Saffron Revolt, the revolt of the monks, you know, asking for uh, humane economic policies towards the public. And the monks were shot down. The world was shocked. And the Buddhist monks in those days around the world, especially the Burmese monks, were cheered upon and admired for standing up against the brutal regime yeah, that um, uh, has created so much hardship for the entire population. And Buddhist monks today, especially Bur Burmese monks and Sri Lankan monks, you know, are seen as <laughs> basically you know, uh, racist, violent neo-Nazis in monks' uniform. That, you know, to, to put it crudely, but that's also quite close to a reality on the ground. Um, and then in 2008, May, there, was, um, there were two events, actually one major event planned by the regime. That was a referendum that, uh, uh, by which the military would adopt the constitution of, for, and by the military. Yeah? And, and so the, the, one of the problems talking about reforms and constitutionalism is that you know, constitution by definition is a, is a document that attempts to like essentially uh, 
um, divide the power so that no group can, you know, in, in, in one interpretation, no single group can have monopoly over the, uh, the, the running of the country or the kingdom. You know, in the old days, constitution limits the power of divine authority. Authority of the king is no longer divine. The king had to consult with privy council and listen to the, the you know, different laws. But we have a scenario in Burma. The military drew up a constitution and the, the ultimate aim of the constitution is to put the single institution of armed forces above the law. It isn't simply about the constitution grants the military 25% of the parliamentary seats, which they will gradually uh, phase themselves out. The, there are two additional problems in addition to 25% guarantee yeah, for the uh, military uh, in the parliament. And one is that the military is authorized to launch a coup at any given time that they deem you know, in the national interest. Yeah? This is a constitution that preemptively legalized any future military coup. Yeah? And then thirdly, the, um, the military will never, basically the constitution also grants blanket impunity. It's like the United States that holds the world to one standard and that places itself any type of international treaties and doctrines. So we have that scenario. And that despite the nitty gritties in other, on other issues, like you know, less relevant to me, uh, like Aung San Suu Kyi not becoming president. You know, in the larger, grander scheme of things, whether she becomes president or head of state is irrelevant in terms of you know, historical democratization process. What is most important is that three points I mentioned. One single institution placing itself above the law granting itself impunity for anything it has done over the past 53 years, or it will be doing, or it is doing today. And then lastly, without contesting, they, they have 25% guaranteed seat in the, at the table. Yeah. And so those are the major things. And that constitution was scheduled to be voted in a referendum. And unfortunately, or fortunately for the military, the cyclone hit the country two, just two weeks, exactly two weeks, before the constitutional referendum was scheduled. And uh, the state, at, in 2008, the state of the military's leadership, uh, that mental state, was such that they were so paranoid of US invasion, yeah? using the uh, rescue mission as a pretext, that they would let thousands of cyclone victims go without drinkable water. Yeah. And until that time, between 2004 and 2008, when I, as an activist, was persuaded by the basically what I saw, as that the West was not really serious about helping Burma to democratize. Because I, I was a dissident, you know, begging for support from around the world, like, you know, Oslo, like Stockholm, like, you know, Berlin, Paris, Washington. Lobbying. There was a split within the military. This is a time to push. Can you, you know, uh, basically uh, strengthen our hand so that, you know, the, the, the more self-enlightened and smarter faction would win over? Obviously, that, you know, uh, that... Uh, I guess like calculation at the time did not turn out to be um, true either. So I wasn't uh, entirely correct myself. So, but the point I wanted to mention is that when the, uh, when the, um, the cyclone hit the country, the top leadership of the military prioritized going ahead with adopting the military's constitution over saving the lives of thousands of people. To date, we will not know how many people died as a result of, you know, basically, the, the blockade of e refusal to accept international emergency missions. You know, the most, I mean, if you're a humanitarian worker, you would know the first 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours are most crucial for saving lives and when a country is hit by a catastrophe. And in, you know, they blocked the aid for seven whole days. 
Yeah? And at the time, I was working with the head of intelligence. Yeah? And, and not working for them. I was in, engaged in what was called, <coughs> what is called a second track, or track two diplomacy, trying to bring the Burmese uh, negotiators with the different um, representatives from Western governments, have them open dialogue off the record to find ways to re-engage the country. When I thought that isolation was failing us as a democratic movement and failing the Burmese public. And it was at that time that I decided that they crossed the line. You know, monks protesting, students protesting on the streets, calling for the downfall of the regime, a general strike. Okay, the, the, they send the troops in, they shoot and kill. It is unacceptable, but it can be understood. It cannot be accepted, but it can be understood. A regime, repressive regime with so many skeletons in its closet, feeling that they, maybe it's their turn to lose their head, so they send the troops, yeah? So self-protection, uh, uh, survival, I can understand it. But cyclone victims, what do they have? What, what had they done to deserve being deprived of drinkable water in the first 72 hours when they lost entire families? You know, little girls or like boys hanging on to the, uh, the trees when the, the flood was, you know, carrying their parents away. And this was the scenario that where the regime showed to me its true color, that they did not give a damn about public well-being. Yeah? And then so, now on to the reform. Fast forward from 2008 to 2010, 2011, you know, and what happened in Tunisia, uh, what happened in you know, Libya, what happened to Mubarak. The, in the Burmese language media, some of the highest ranking military officers openly talked about how they did not want to end up like Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein or Mubarak or Ben Ali from Tunisia. Yeah? So they were ready from the state of being completely paranoid to, to wanting to give themselves an exit strategy. And at the time, Obama had this you know, thing. Well, we're going to like, you know, what, what sort of a, uh, he would shake hands uh, in, you know, instead of like uh, uh, give a fist, um, uh, you know, you, uh, the, the, his famous um, quote. He would welcome working with the dodgy regime if they were, uh, you know, to become less dodgy. You know, that's what it is. And so, um, so it was in that context the regime launched the reform. And in launching the reform, actually, the world was taken by surprise, but not Western governments, because they were involved in getting this reform launched. They were lobbying he Aung San Suu Kyi heavily, to accept the terms of engagement with the Burmese regime, Americans especially, and the British especially, behind the scene, they were pushing and actually pressuring Aung San Suu Kyi to work with the regime, work within the system. And she is, you know, so that around that, uh, around the reforms, there, were, there, there is, or there has been, or there had been more hypes than the substance. Because the reforms are undertaken for the wrong reasons and towards the wrong goal. Yeah? What are the wrong reasons? Well, the, the wrong reason. If you look at the reforms, they are not, substantively speaking, they are not reforms. They are realignment of military's interests. Yeah? So that they will become, quote unquote, presentable, respectable, Credible in the eyes of the international community, yeah, and um, and there is no value shift within the ruling military top leadership or within the entire armed forces. There is absolutely no value transformation. You know, like any other um, entity, e even like commercial entity, they say we this these are our values. You know, like uh, social responsibility, all that, and then. The interest, what the military is trying to do is, um, you know, have the cake and eat it. Because reforms, genuine reforms mean 
the military reducing the size of the pie in terms of its economic control, in terms of its administrative and political control over Burmese politics. And they are prepared to do neither. And from their perspective, reforms mean you know, um, uh, uh, less control, less wealth, less acquisition of you know, resources. And, and so, and, and, and ultimately, they see genuine reform as simply digging their own graves. Yeah? And they may be crude and crass in certain ways that they conduct themselves, but they're not stupid. They are rational actors. They know genuine reforms mean genuine democratization. It is like, you know, you cannot have half pregnant. That's why I mean, I love the, I love the line. You know, the, um, well, this is not a perfect democracy. Where is a perfect democracy? Of course, like, you've got to work with the democratization part process. Well, the goal of the reform is to develop or build disciplined, flourishing democracy. Yeah? Well, who are the disciplinarians? Of course, the generals and the military guys, they would discipline the people. And, and finally, on the reform, one thing that the international community has failed to understand is how the military process and, and see the world and the reality of Burma. They see themselves, over the past 50 years, every single military cadet you know, has been brainwashed to think he is a cut above the rest of the society. He is essentially the, uh, you know, entitled to rule. If you look at the current military leadership, they are feudal. Feudal in the sense that they are second generation generals. Their fathers were top leaders of the previous generation. Now, commander in chief, may outline his father was a home minister and commander of Western Command who was involved in ethnic cleansing of the military. Now the son is carrying on with father's legacy. The head of the intelligence now, 53 years old, I worked with him for four years, and he, at the time he was a lieutenant colonel. He is now a lieutenant general. He, his father died in action. You know, um, and so the, the second generation leaders are now coming up. And they have been in power for 50 years. The military in Burma is not just one of many institutions. It is a class in an office hall. So because it is a class, it has serious and definable core interest. And those core interests they define as, you know, the ultimate control over politics and economy. Yeah. And now on to the uh, ceasefire. Like Amara talked about the difficulty of <coughs> uh, uh, hammering out the nitty gritty. No, the problem is not about nitty gritty. The problem start with the macro picture. Federalism is no, no to every single military officer. Yeah, I heard it from their mouth straight up. Federalism, no, no, that's going to be balkanization for Burma. Yeah, we have, according to the Burmese you know, uh, statistics, we have 135 ethnic groups. Yeah, 57 of them are under the rubric of Chin. And some of them are not even real ethnic people. They are names of the rivers. But nevertheless, they are counted as ethnic groups. 135. You know, providing that they are true, they are not. But uh, if you have that multi-ethnic community, you cannot have a unitary state. It's just simply not possible. It has to be a federal arrangement, whether it's arranged along geographic lines or ethnic lines. The arrangement, political arrangement of the Burmese state and an administrative structure have to be federal. The unitary state dictatorship system, that's not going to work. And the only viable form of the state constitution has to be federal. And that is the, the only viable form is also the form that the military cannot accept. So just like yesterday, the, the Korean National Union came out officially saying, no way we will sign anything. The KNU is considered the 
you know, the closest ethnic group with the Burmese military regime, or the President Deng Sein and negotiators. And the K, if, you, if KNU say no, that means there is no chance of ethnic ceasefire. K, the KNU say four points. We need to have federalism as a, the only viable structure as part of the discussion. We please need to have a... Closer to the microphone, please. Now you're in between two. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, the, um, we need to federalize the army. At the moment, there is not a single colonel yeah, who is non-Buddhist. And th there is not a single brigadier who is not a Burman chauvinist. So it's so all like, you know, they, the army has purged itself of ethnic and religious diversity in a country that is so ethnically and religiously diverse. In other words, we've got an army which is not only feudal, but also racist in the sense that one single ethnic group, Burmese, which I belong to, controls everything. Yeah? You cannot have a sustainable national, a nation state that, um, you know, uh, with a single um, ethnic group controlling it. Finally, uh, just one minute. The, um, I, back in um, 2013, in November, I published an, uh, an essay in the New York Times saying ethnic ceasefire is not possible. Because simply because the military rejects the, the only viable framework which will work for everybody, yeah? or reasonably. And, uh, you know, at the time, like Jimmy Carter and the so-called elders were going and pressuring the ethnic groups and civil society to accept the military's offer uh, of the or terms of the uh, ethnic ceasefire. That was November 2013. And uh, Thane Sein and Almin, they do not have real power. Yeah? The, the, you have a serious problem when you have an ethnic uh, ne ceasefire negotiation, political negotiation, where the negotiators and, and the, the highest authority or office that authorizes negotiation do not have any control over the military, which is the backbone of the regime's power. And finally, the, um, on the Rohingya, Two points, very quickly. People have described the Rohingya uh, situation as communal, sectarian, a Buddhist Rakhine versus Muslim Rohingyas. And secondly, they have, a lot of people have seen it or presented it as uh, an unfortunate but almost inevitable outcome of ethnic, uh, multi-ethnic societies opening up mini balkanization that's you know but the fact is persecution of rohingyas are state directed it predates the opening of burma by about 35 years starting in 1978 why rohingyas were single out when the you know that they, they were not armed they were not fighting because the burmese military have developed this strategic calculation that one to two million uh, Muslim population with a single geographic pocket next to the most populous uh, or one of the most populous Muslim nation, Bangladesh, is a liability. Therefore, you need to significantly reduce the Muslim population along the 170 miles border between Bangladesh and Burma. So therefore, they have, despite different changes in the top leadership, who is running, this, they are pursuing a single strategic equation, preemptively pre purging the uh, northern Rakhine state of Rohingyas, who they see as uh, potential proxies for the Bangladeshi army. So therefore, this is no mere uh, ethnic conflict. This is state-directed, I would say, genocide that is, you know, unfolding over the past 37 years. I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Well, um, with that very strong 
statement and analysis, perhaps we can look to see where the paths to change lie. Joachim. Thank you. Those of you that look very, very closely may notice that I'm not Lian Sakong, despite the fact that Lian Sakong was on the, on the poster here. Um, unfortunately, he cannot join us because he is one of the crucial players in drafting the attempts of a, of a, uh, a ceasefire that can lead to a, a, a political process. And as uh, Sarni just mentioned, that process is not really going too well. Uh, the plan was that Union Day, which is Thursday, two days from now, was, it was supposed to be the date where a nationwide ceasefire was uh, signed. And uh, on just one week before, so on Thursday last week, uh, the government announced that uh, it's not possible, we are having to negotiate with too many different groups, and, and so we're going to postpone it. So Lian is busy in Burma at the time, trying to trying to get some sort of uh, progress. Um, but I will still take his place for a short while <coughs> and bring you a little bit about um, this ethnic conflict, ethnic armed conflicts, and uh, particularly the, the, the peace process and particularly the last, the developments during the last six months, the last year or so. Um, and in doing that I will also try to connect a little bit to, to, uh, to what has been said before. <coughs> the, um, Marta has a great point. When, when uh, Tain Sein took office and the military kind of withdrew from, from sight, everybody in the world, especially the Western world, had really, really high expectations. Everybody expected, oh, you know, we've gotten elections, so now it should be just a matter of time, and we will have everything happy and, and, and uh, uh, successful. But that fails to account. I'm just going to go back quickly. We need to go back all the way to, to history to understand the roots of this. This conflict is actually a remain of the Second World War. The fighting has been going on non-stop in Burma since the Second World War. Violence in, in Arakan State, in Rakhine State, was happening in the Second World War. Violence along the, the, against the Karen, violence in Shan, uh, violence in Kashin has been going on basically since the Second World War. There hasn't been peace except uh, in the sense of, of, of uh, positive peace anywhere in the country. There has been negative peace, less visible violence in some parts of the country. Uh, generally, the, the bigger cities and the central areas for the last two decades or so. So, when Burma became independent, and uh, the basis of this independence was, uh, and this is something that, that comes back on, it's uh, symbolically important, but it's also one of the, the issues that has been reported, is uh, the agreement prior to uh, independence at Panglong, where uh, Aung San, uh, who was then the, the Burmese nationalist leader, and several of the uh, leaders of the different ethnic minorities met and agreed to form a union state, a federal union state. It's worth noting that not everyone, not all the ethnic minorities were agreed to this at the time. The Karen only had observers there. They did not sign the, the, the Panglong Agreement. The Kashin and the Shan only signed it if they had the option of leaving the country after 10 years. And, um, and uh, there were several groups that, that were actually actively pursuing independence instead. The Kareni claimed they already had independence. They were never part of the British, British uh, rule. So they didn't need to worry about this new entity being formed because they were already in independent. Uh, the Muslims in Arakan were thinking that maybe they wanted to have their own independence. The Buddhists in Arakan wanted their own independence. Um, so there were a lot of different opinions going on. Since then, since 1947, which is when the, the Panglong Agreement, now pretty much all ethnic minorities agree that the Panglong Agreement is acceptable. Even the ones that didn't participate in that agreement are now saying that this is what we want, a federal union state preferably with um, 
the same amount of, of uh, uh, that each main ethnicity should have uh, its own state. Um, but that is something that, that potentially can be, can be uh, argued. So this is sort of like the starting point of the, of the, of the problem. And then the question is, what do we mean with peace process in Burma? If you look at it from the outside, it looks that there has been a lot of peace process since uh, the 1988 uh, um, massacre of students and, and the, the, the coup against the, the, the replacement of the old junta. And there has been a lot of agreements. Even during the 1990s, as you can see, there were plenty of agreements. <coughs> uh, notably, though, none of these agreements had any political content. Not a single word of politics. The last agreement in Burma that had any type of uh, political content was signed in 1963 with uh, a breakaway faction of the KNU, the Karen National Union, uh, <coughs> that got a little bit of power sharing locally, but of course the, the the junta soon removed that. But <clears throat> since then, there hasn't been any political agreement in Burma. There has been plenty of ceasefires. These ceasefires have largely meant that the local group, the local warlord, the local, you may call it, uh, um, strongest armed uh, factor, uh, for good or bad, have given an opportunity to, to rule their area. And the, the Burman government, the military government, during this time, did not try to dominate these areas. They didn't care about them. They didn't do anything. They didn't engage with them. They didn't support them. They didn't even try to, to make money out of them. They just left them. It's like, so, so there is a point here that these areas are not really seen as part of Burma from the military center. These are sort of these areas in the hills. Everything that happened in these areas, development uh, happened because it was done by the local actors. Business, it was by local actors, but particularly with, with the Chinese uh, or Thai business interest. No Burmese businessman went from Yangon or Mandalay up into any of these areas, despite them having ceasefires that were lasting for 19, 20 years. They didn't even go up there and say, like, oh, you know, there are natural resources. I'm going to make money out of this. They just didn't care. And then we had <coughs> the so-called, uh, well, the reforms. You can call them reforms because they were reforms, the so-called democratization. Since then, there has been a lot of, <coughs> a lot of agreements. Again, none of these have actually had any political content. Some of them have, in, and you can see there are several agreements with the same groups, and I may have even missed a few, but uh, it's kind of hard to keep, keep track of it in, in, in a document like this. Uh, but it's still sort of, in some of them there are sort of allusions that like, oh, in the future we maybe will start talking about, <coughs> uh, talk about, um, an agreement. So when Tang Seng came into power and decided that he wanted, or the government said, we want to start having a, a peace process, <clears throat> the first thing to look at then is like, okay, so what were the aims of the government in this peace process? Well, they basically wanted to keep control and keep things pretty much as they were. Change as little as possible. They didn't have any stated agenda. I mean, th the first year of talks, all they were saying like, oh, you know, this problem is just because these areas are underdeveloped. We just need to throw them some money or build a school or build a road or something like that. That's it. No talk about uh, political representation, no talk about ethnicity, no talk about impunity for, for human rights violations or so forth. Nothing like that. These are things that eventually, during this long process, Several of these things have started to come up, at least on the table. There's no agreement on them, but at least they're starting to talk about it. Um, the goal for, the, for the, the rebel side, as you see, there are quite a few of them, so I'm just going to 
clumped and together as rebels now for, for, for the moment, or the armed ethnic... And then we'll uh, take it to questions and answers and we'll come back. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, was largely um, um, quite divisive at first. Many of them had the, like separate, separate, uh, separate aims from these processes, but they soon focused on, well, we need to know that there's going to be a they wanted to have a joint negotiation and not split negotiations with everyone else. They wanted to have a nationwide ceasefire and not local um, agreements. Uh, they wanted to have a regulated ceasefire, actually with what does it imply, not just something that we say to the media. And they wanted to have uh, a political basis for, for polit uh, the basis for future political talks would be a discussion of the union, a federal union. About six months ago, about a year ago, Lian was very, very positive <coughs> um, because it seemed like these things were getting on the table. Instead of having all these plethora of different small agreements, they were starting to meet in joint negotiation teams. They were talking about a national ceasefire. They were talking about a federal federal union, and by Sept August September last year, there was actually a tacit recognition by the government that, yeah, federal union is probably something we can we can work with in the future. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi started saying like, oh, we think uh, NLD think that a federal union is very important, and uh, <coughs> and new talks. Uh, were held in September, uh, which was going to iron out these last. Out of 104 principles, there were only five or seven or something like that that were unclear. So they were thinking, like, you know, this, like Mike said, now we're actually getting close. Then suddenly the militaries took a step back and said, well, if we're going to participate in this, because the government is not just one, it's not just the political, the military also have a negotiator there. And they also, <clears throat> and they said, well, yeah, th this looks good, but by the way, you forgot that we are not going to accept any agreement um, unless you first recognize and accept the 2008 constitution, which is something that, that before had been dealt with and, and and sort of like swept away. And also, if we're going to have a ceasefire, we want all of the ethnic armed groups to dis disarm first. Which, of course, led to pretty much a complete... I mean, talks have been going on, but there has been absolutely no progress. Uh, and as of now, it seems like, like, um, like even future talks are, are becoming more and more uh, difficult to sustain. Uh, the process has not stopped or reversed yet, but it definitely is not going forward. And um, this has also a lot to do with the fact that we have a long conflict. The most important difficulty for getting to any type of ceasefire or peace agreement in a conflict, especially a conflict that's been going on for this long, is for the parties to build trust, to overcome um, the credible commitment problem in, in academic jargon. <coughs> and in order to do that, it's important for both sides to constantly show, um, signal their good, good intentions. Since these talks started in 2011, the military has continued to move forces, to advance their forces, to strengthen their forces, and to engage in attacks against, the, among other, the Kashin organization, which was one of the ones that had the longest, most stable cooperative arrangement with the old Burma Junta. So there is the little trust that has been built has at the same time been undermined. And I agree with, with, with Sarni in saying that, that for Burma's future, there is a huge elephant in the room, and it's not a white elephant, and that, but that elephant is the military. Thanks, Joachim. Or rather, no thanks, because I asked you to guide us 
in a credible way forward and all you did was to describe how difficult the situation <laughs> is. Uh, look, we have half an hour and I'm sure there are very many knowledgeable people in the audience who will raise issues. So uh, we have uh, microphones right and left and uh, if you signal, here is one, we can start up there please and then we can continue there. Uh, and please do introduce yourselves, who you are. Uh, be a bit uh, brief and to the point. If you have a statement, by all means, make your point. But uh, let's also give uh, uh, others a chance to comment. Please. My name is Björn Ture Carlson. I was the uh, senior deputy resident for UNDP in Burma, 87 to 90. I may have had a little part to play in the events of 1988 by bringing the information to Nevin what had happened to his beloved country. You have to remember that Burma is one of the richest countries in the world. Before the war, the Second World War, it was the sec had the second highest GDP per capita in Asia after Japan. It had the best schools, it had the best medical education, it had the best infrastructure at, at that, that time. Until, of course, the, the sort of the communist insurgencies in, in the 1950s and other things. My point here is that I would fully endorse what Omar has been describing as the situation in Burma. And also that Joachim has pointed out that this goes back to the Panglong Agreement when Suchi's father, Aung San, prevailed upon the others to uh, enter this agreement which, of course, was conditional on the part of the major uh, states in, in, in Burma. And that, indeed, it is not one unitary country, even if the Burmans count themselves as about 60% of the population. But the Burmans have always seen themselves as being the ones who have been ordained to lead the country. They were the ones who led the country for a very long period of time, and they, they uh, were mostly fighting so the, the Thais who were competing in that part of the world for the dominance. Now, one has to keep this in mind, that this is still sort of a situation which is quite sort of alive, and that that will make the, uh, uh, any sort of peace process very difficult. Also, Burma is located strategically between so the two emerging superpowers in, in Southeast Asia and South Asia, India and China. And the Chinese have a very strong interest in what is going on in, in Myanmar. And they cannot be sort of eliminated from this uh, process of doing anything in, in Burma. Now, my suggestion would be to look at, at uh, Myanmar not as, let's say, a development or a political problem, but as a security problem. And involve the UN, especially the Security Council, not so the General Assembly or the Economic and Social Council, but the Security Council for um, bringing the situation together to discuss the question of some form of a new basic constitution for, for, for Myanmar. Uh, be, because there is no way that, that the uh, constitution which is currently in effect can be changed. There's no mechanism for changing that constitution. It has to be done by people outside. And this is where I think the process should be looking ahead for. Thank you. Thanks, Björn. It sounds like you should have been on the panel, but uh, uh, knowing uh, the kinds of uh, requirements to get to a solution, not only outsiders can do it, but it has to come from inside, as you well know. So, I had a, a microphone up here. Hmm? Um, my name is Lubna Qureshi, and I'm from Stockholm University. Um, I am frankly disgusted Hello? by the uh, failure of Aung San Suu Kyi to condemn the persecution of the Muslim minority in Burma. Um, she has shown so much courage in the past. What has led to this moral compromise? And what is her personal attitude about Muslims? Thank you. Thank you. Here. My name is Bawin. I'm a dissident like Z <laughs> Dr. Zani. So I like the international community. Can I call my country as Burma? Because I don't believe that dictators can change the name of my, uh, of my country without the consensus of the people. So I agree to all the three speakers and I'd like to supplement that as far as the peace negotiation
administration is concerned, the government is putting the cart before the horse. If two persons are fighting, then in order to stop, we have to talk, and then we may sign a ceasefire again. Now, without talking, we cannot sign a ceasefire. There's no talking, so they can make a ceasefire. Another is the federal one. Federal constitution. Either you look in the dictator country that ruled by hand, like China, so many tribes, so many races, still federal. Or if you look at the democratic country, like India, so many types are still federal because that is a real federal union. And the other aspect is, as Professor John Kemp said, the essence of the union day where Burma come into being is that all the leaders come, including Aung San, Father Aung San Suu Kyi, as a leader, not a national leader, as a leader of the Burma proper and the Shan come as a leader of Shan, so also the Chin as a leader of Chin. So they are not a national. They come and they have a consensus. And so it's very, very important for the international community, especially the Western government, to look government Burma not as a monolithic whole, but as part of it. Now, we, we discover that many of the NGOs and the international have been going and dealing with the government only or with the government-related NGO and nothing to do with uh, the opposition like the UNFC or the, except one NGO from uh, uh, Japan, Nippon uh, organization that is helping uh, the real marginalized people through it. So uh, that's what I like to uh, emphasize. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Zani, would you like to uh, comment? Uh, let's keep it uh, brief, so because I can see there are many who would like to come back. But on the uh, uh, microphone, please, just to bring it closer to you. On th on the issue um, that uh, gentleman raised about the need for a Security Council to take it up. I mean, as you very well know, you know the. Uh, <clears throat> UN Security Council does not take up issues that are not defined as a threat to international peace. And uh, um, hmm? yes, um, you know the um, also there are other principles like responsibility to protect. You know, are to be when a sovereign state fails to protect or like you know deliberately inflict harms on its own people. You know, it falls on the international community. I mean, this is uh, uh, Kofi Annan's uh, guilt-ridden uh, reaction to his failure in Rwanda. You know, R2P, the principle. It's not a treaty. It's not a binding thing. So there's a principle out there. But, you know, the R2P has never been seriously entertained with respect to, uh, to Burma. I mean, I talked to um, Gareth Evans for about a half hour. Uh, you know, one on one. Say, look, you know, well, you are the you are one of the architects of R2P, and that this country, my country, fits a profile. He said, "Well, it's an R2P concern. This, that, and you know, he's never done anything uh, with the R2P." The, uh, the so I think the problem with um, involving Security Council, um, even when the three, especially like uh, Anglo-American bloc, you know, U.S. and U.K., when they considered Burma an axis of evil, you know, one of them, uh, they, um, they didn't, they did not have, you know, they were basically uh, overpowered by double veto by Russia and China. In the history of, um, you know, uh, the, the usage of veto in the Security Council, that was one of the very, very rare moment where Russians and Chinese team up <laughs> to veto a resolution that was not binding. And so, you know, I, I think... Security Council is very difficult to use, is what you are saying. Yes, I mean, it's, so it's, it's deadlocked. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, the, I, I think I would start with the European Union. Um, you know, uh, there are a lot of good um, intentioning, um, you know, officials in Scandinavia, uh, especially Scandinavia, because I think like uh, Scandinavians, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not here... Um, 
a bit, a bit politicking. I think Scandinavians take the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the responsibilities to uh, promoting human rights much more seriously than other, you know, say like Anglo-Americans. You know, I live in the UK, so I know the British talk a uh, forked tongue. And so, um, I mean, a diplomat's not the, <laughs> not the country. And, and so, you know, the start with um, getting, say, Scandinavian bloc. In other words, a common position, a common analysis, common framework among the Scandinavian countries first, and then press the European Union to come up with a common position. Because the Burmese regime cannot be pressured to do anything bilaterally. You know, they can, even if you present a multilateral uh, pressure, they will find ways to divide you. OIC, for instance. You know, at, uh, on I mean, right as a response to the uh, the uh, attacks on the Rohingyas in uh, June and October of 2012, the OIC was beginning to speak. You know, 57 member countries beginning to speak with a single voice. They're starting to drop the word Rohingya, you know, in their statements, and the the Burmese regime immediately moved in and split the OIC. You know, what does Iran want? We offer something Iran, something to Iran, and and then like they, they secure the support and collaboration of the largest Muslim government in the world, Indonesia, by you know, economic enticement. And so on, finally on the um, Aung San Suu Kyi's, um, uh, you know, your question about Aung San Suu Kyi's position, why is she silent? Well, she's silent because the Rakhines told her in no certain terms. You mentioned the word Rohingya and NLD is finished in our state. So when, and also she didn't also um, really do the homework on the Rohingya issue. When she first came out of Burma, uh, she stopped in, uh, in Geneva, had a press conference. She was asked a simple question. Do you think that Rohingyas are Myanmar citizens? And her answer, as the person who was bidding to, or wanting or, you know, who wanted to be president, <laughs> she didn't have a straightforward answer. She said, I don't know. So when she arrived in London for a, uh, for a, uh, um, a public forum at, at London School of Economics, and I was with her on the panel, and I was pre-assigned to address the issue of Rohingya because Aung San Suu Kyi told Foreign Office she didn't want to deal with it. So Foreign Office says Aung San Suu Kyi is in a listening mode. And so I was told two days in advance, if someone raises the Rohingya issue, that's yours. And so like, they gave me the, the rope to hang myself. And so, you know, I hang myself, I still, I'm still alive. And so uh, the, in I'm terms of her here. position on the Muslims, she, she, essentially reveal her Islamophobia on the radio, none other than Radio 4 in England. That is actually prime radio program in the in UK where she was asked, you know, um, the, um, to, to, to condemn the violence against the Muslims and Rohingyas. She, ref she evaded the question and justify it using the rhetoric of uh, the rise of Muslim power. So, you know, uh, for the record, I'll say she is, uh, she is anti-Muslim. Marta? Uh, I want to ad address the, um, one of the points raised by um, Uba Win, uh, about um, the international community working with the uh, with, uh, Myanmar government. And then, I'm, of course, the Norwegian government is one of the first governments to engage very closely with with the uh, Myanmar government, and and frankly, I th I think that this is the right thing to do. I think it is uh, the only way to at least try to uh, influence. Um, I know Zani maybe say that this is an important and a deadlock situation, and or a, a dead end anyway. But I think, considering the situation, I think this is the only r uh, right thing to do. But you're absolutely right. It's vital that also the grassroots. Uh, community gets the international support and, it, and that it's continue both with the democratic opposition but not least with uh, ethnic groups. But I also think that there are other, um, all the international communities, it's not just the Nippon Foundation that are working very closely with grassroots, uh, both uh, low-key or, or under the radar but also officially. So uh, so I think, uh, but but we need to continue to keep that pressure up. But the, but it's not only the Nippon Foundation, fortunately, because that would uh, that would be a disaster if it was only them. On the, I, I, on the, on the issue of, of um, 
Aung San Suu Kyi and, uh, and uh, her take on, on Muslims, I think nobody really knows what's going on in her head. Uh, but I think also, of course, the, many people now try to frame NLD as sort of soft on Muslim, and that's sort of the only way to beat them. So I think this is both politically um, that she she's weak, uh, she's avoiding the issue because she thinks it's difficult politically, but also we don't really know her stand on it. So, um, disgusted or not, it's, uh, she's not the only one in, in Myanmar at the moment. That she's, there is basically very, very few people standing up for Muslim these days. And it's a, it's a big problem of Buddhist nationalism and the lack of an inclusive okay. national identity. Let's in the take country. a few more questions and you, you can all come back, even you, Joachim. There are three people here who are asking to talk. Let's take them in a, in a row. Uh, please be brief and introduce yourselves. Um, Katya Sarajeva from Spider. Thank you for very inspiring um, presentations. I want to pick up on what Marta said about the civil society and the grassroots. You've all painted a fairly dismal picture of the future. But can you say something about the success or any progress from the grassroots and what can civil society do and can we do to support them? Thanks a lot. Next one. Uh, you have a mic, okay, you can do it, but uh, please, yeah. Sorry, is this on? Um, hi, my name is Shantana Shahid. I'm with the Swedish Burma Committee. I have a comment and a question, really briefly. Um, on Aung San Suu Kyi, I think that instead of placing all these expectations on one person. You should hold the government of Myanmar to account for failing to protect their citizens. They are responsible and instead of just entirely swallowing their, their rhetoric on that this is such an unfortunate uh, development, we've been dealt a bad hand, this is communal violence. And there is so much evidence that discrimination against the Rohingya and other Muslim populations is systematic and is state sanctioned. So hold them to account for that, instead of constantly expecting this from a um, formal Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, my question is also on the EU, um, elaborating on what Zarni brought up. Um, all of you, or everyone in the panel, you seem to share a rather skeptical understanding of the developments in Burma, or a nuanced understanding, I would say. Joachim Kreutz, you called it the so-called democratization. Zarni, you emphasized that the reform process is actually a process to maintain military power, but in just a different shape. Um, but the EU's analysis is completely different. If you go into their website, I just went in right now. The question? Yes, the, f the first sentence is, the first sentence is, um, the government of uh, Myanmar are committed to a genuine democratization. And this analysis is going to inform the EU's policies, and they've just recently announced billions and billions of EU, um, of EU money in support of the government's reform process. So I'd like to ask the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, since you work with um, informing international debate on international affairs, why is the EU's uh, analysis so entirely off? <laughs> That's for you, you are uh, back <laughs> over there, please. Yes, uh, my name is Samuel Munk um, from Burma as well. Um, just a very straightforward question. Do you think uh, there will be election in 2000, like this year? And the reason is that in relation to that, the, the, the government has said that without having the ceasefire dialogue, ceasefire, uh, uh, a ceasefire agreement, there won't probably be an election. So there's a worry about that. And I, w I think you can have rightly point out the, the fact that um, the, if, if when we listen to the the, mi the minister of the president office, he's very positive and things like oh yeah, then we will we'll get the agreement in two weeks or three months. Um, but but in 2013 October, that was just before the meeting in Liza, and then the army said that. The army is involved in the process, and and even in the parliament, I think the home minister, I think General Jowin, he was saying that the negotiation with the ceasefire is currently with the uh, the constitution. So, and if if there won't be a ceasefire agreement in February this uh, February the 12th, do you think it's a, there will be a problem for the election? Thanks. And then there was this gentleman there as well. 
My name is Ruang Lian. I come from Burma and I'm studying theology and human rights at Stockholm School of Theology. I have one comment, one clarification and one question. Um, concerning with Dr. Zani, um, I agree with, uh, uh, I mean, in line with Dr. Zani, um, I'm skeptic of the democratization of Burma. And one clarification is, if I'm not mistaken, um, Mr. Joachim said that only the Kachin and the Xi'an signed Penglong Agreement. But as far as I know, uh, the Qin also signed the Penglong Agreement under the leadership of Pukyomang. And my question is, uh, from ethnic perspective, uh, we have been fighting for our freedom for 60, more than 60 years through uh, simply putting vi in violent means. But uh, it seems uh, we failed in that fighting. After 2010, um, there is a possibility of a peaceful transition in Burma through a roundtable uh, dialogue. But it seems uh, impossible again now. So is there any hope for a peaceful change in Burma? Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so we'll come back to the panel now. We'll take it in reverse order. You are Kim Marte and then Mohan. Okay, I will first do very quick answers on some of the questions here. Um, about the, the successful grassroots movements, I think there are plenty, too, too many to actually mention here, and, and, uh, and there are a lot of successes going on, um, and especially, I would, I would highlight especially a lot of the work that has been done by um, different environmental NGOs, environmental and, and human rights NGOs that are getting um, so like a new generation that are uh, cooperating across across ethnic boundaries and so forth, but also several women's movements and of course the 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 ability of many people to to return to the country is is positive. <coughs> um, the EU analysis, I think, is a little bit wishful thinking. They really, really want. Burma's government to be committed to uh, democratization, so they say that they are. Um, but I think that's that's a general thing. If you if you look at at the EU or Western the the US or the EU, up until 2010 in the media and and in all publications, everything that was highlighted was things that were bad in Burma, everything bad, nothing positive because there were already back then some positive things, not necessarily by the government, but things were not always awful. Since then, there has been a complete reversal. Now everything good is reported, nothing bad. Um, the, uh, I, sorry to be nitpicky, but the clarification, I, I, many groups signed the Palong ag Agreement, but only the Kashin and Shan had the right of, uh, of leaving, of secession. That was my, my point, so I was sorry if I was, if I was uh, unclear. Um, Elections, we've talked about this, me and Marte, over lunch. Um, I think the elections will be postponed. Um, probably pushed into the beginning of next year um, due to security reasons or something like that. But then I want to go back to, to something said about China before. We didn't answer that question. And I think China is actually some, somewhat, strangely, a, posi a, a possible positive influence. China was actually quite willing to act uh, in trying to, to settle these conflicts, not necessarily by any fair means, but they just want stability in the north of Burma and, and, and everywhere. So I think that could also be a way of, of international community to sort of, because now the Chinese are actually getting kind of annoyed because these Burmese, um, uh, companies they were working with before are starting to come into Yunnan and saying that, oh, you know, if you don't give us a good price, we're going to go to the American companies instead. So the Chinese really, I mean, like the Chinese have, they are, have so much to gain from the process as it is now, but they will, uh, they can also be um, enticed into supporting continued reform. 
not because they believe in democracy and, and have a good heart, but because they want to make money and they like stability. Thanks a lot, Joachim, and thanks for being the driver to bring us uh, together. Marte, do you see any uh, light at the end of this tunnel? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Spider. The grassroots, I think that's the success story of Myanmar this day. I think that's what came out of the tragedy of, of Nargis, was actually confidence among some grassroots organizations and, and the beginning of a civil society, a real civil society in Myanmar. And since the the reform since the Uthain Sein government with freedom of speech, more uh, more legal organization, this is what is really changing Myanmar today. So I think that's, I think we here all agree that the, uh, the reform or democratization or peace is not going to come from the, the army. They will, they will give a little bit, but they will keep most of it of the power. But what, what can actually change this to become a more positive and more uh, and even a democratic society uh, some decades ahead, that will be the, the, the development of, of grassroots organization and, and uh, civil society in Myanmar. Elections? Yes, I think there will be elections. I, <laughs> I think there will be because I think the, the government and also the Tatmadaw, they have invested so much in their precious seven point uh, plan to demo uh, dem discipline flourishing democracy uh, and it's constitutional binding to have elections this year and I think they will they will do their best to do it but that does not mean that we after the election will have the end point of democratization in, in Myanmar that is as I said earlier that's just the first step also that's just like a, a milestone but uh, yes I think there will be elections and and, and uh, possibly in, in, in November. Thank you <coughs> very much, Marte, and thanks for your work with PRIO and us. Elections, but what can we expect? Um, I want to return to the uh, European Union. I, you know, this is a half a joke. I thought that uh, European Union only provided its, um, you know, Eurocrats with Viagra. I didn't realize they also provide them with LSD. It seems like uh, Brussels dropping a lot of LSD on Burma, seeing things that <laughs> and hearing things over there. You know, everything is good. Yeah, it's like a very Orwellian. Um, <clears throat> on the elections, I'm not as sure as uh, Marta is uh, knowing the generals because uh, nothing binds them except their self-interests and their strategic equations and so you know the, the, the you know everyone in the in burma knows that the, the um, burma burma i mean the army the general strategy uh, the generals and their strategists uh, approach everything as a military operation they have a plan a, they you know they openly say we have plan a to z in burmese from kaji to uh, r you know they have so many plans and and the fact of the matter is that the international politics favors the burmese regime they will get away with, they have gotten away with murder over the past 53 years since 1962 they play they you are dealing with an extremely ruthless brutal but brilliant strategist yeah and and do not under the, 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 you know, they will sweet talk you they will charm you you know you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Thane saying but you know Zagana the, the, the most famous comedian Zagana described the president who is held up as the Mr. Reformer and shortlisted reportedly for Nobel Peace Prize as Mr. Nothing because he is nothing because he is playing the role where that he is assigned to according to the army script and now the newer generation of the uh, the uh, uh, the the military officers generals in their early 50s and l uh, late 40s and 40s they're like we have to have our own pie. You have done your part when you were older. Now it's our turn. And so, th I I I think that um, I am not seeing light at the end of the tunnel. I do want to see it because if I don't see light at the end of the tunnel, that means I will never see my mother again, who is 78 and crippled. So as a Burmese of all the everyone of all the people in here i am dying to be optimistic but the realities and the, my analysis of the realities dictate that uh, that things are not going to turn out there's not going to be hollywood happy ending thank you mangzarni
Well, it's tough and it has to be discussed and we have to stay engaged and thank you for being here and we do wish you to see your mother. Thank you.